Good morning, everyone, or oh, afternoon, I suppose. Um, right, okay, so what we're looking at today, uh, and we're kind of ranging over the whole of the Prime Minister Jim Brody, a bit less coming in from the closing chapters, um, which we'll kind of focus on in a slightly different way as we go further through. Um, but he's kind of debating around whether we can view this as in any way a feminist text. Now, you are not going to come to a straightforward yes or no at the end of this. Uh, and that's kind of not the point, because in this course, you want to be able to kind of debate around it. You want to be able to get in the different views and kind of work that in as part of it. So what we're going to look at, um, we're going to kind of contextualize this um, in terms of the kind of overall debate. Um, and consider the, the kind of context that surround this. So just again, linking back into those changing contexts at various points in time, just making sure that you're aware that you want to kind of be recognizing these as you kind of bring it in. Um, very briefly, I'll, I'll just introduce a very small bit of criticism. Um, again, you're just looking for these little bits that you can build in to help you discuss these points, to develop these points um, in a kind of clearer fashion. Um, and then I've kind of, to make it a bit easier and a bit more straightforward, I've collected together a couple of pages of little extracts from uh, across the book, um, which should get attached to this email. And we'll kind of go through them, we'll sort them out and consider where they kind of fit on essentially a kind of spectrum um, in relation to kind of uh, the feminist kind of debate that surrounds the novel. And I'll try and create some links into the other questions briefly. Obviously, you know, you should have picked up by the sounds of this. It's probably going to fit a bit more with the kind of gender and sexuality question, but we can still link it into the other questions. The cats are fighting. Right. Um, okay. So um, what I want you to do to start with, um, I've got a kind of series of three things to kind of look up here. Um, the first one, you need to think about, well, how has the idea of what an empowered female looks like changed over time, kind of now, in the 1930s, 1960s? Are there things that have kind of remained the same with this? Um, then you've got the reference to the Bechdel test, um, which is, generally used more in relation to kind of film but for the sake of our kind of argument here i think we can use this as a kind of way of testing uh, the primus gene Brody around it um, i also want you to look up well what does it mean by kind of surplus women in the context of 1930s um kind of period okay so <clears throat> go through have a think about those three that'll start us off and place into context for the rest of it Okay, so again, we, we kind of mentioned this briefly yesterday, but it's it's worth bringing back in now again. If you think about kind of ideas of feminism in the 1930s, well, you're looking at kind of simply the freedom to have a job, to kind of earn for oneself, um, the freedom, the right to vote, which has more recently kind of been brought in. And yes, there are kind of discussions that take this further, but to have those kind of elements um, that kind of not fully be reliant on a male figure. In many ways, that constitutes female empowerment. It's the 1960s where you get um, the kind of ideas of female empowerment being linked a lot more around kind of um, freedom in terms of sex and sexuality. And then nowadays you've got a kind of more modern definition of feminism with a far broader array of kind of freedoms that goes with this. Now, this means that when we look at the Prime Minister Jim Brodie and as we debate around, well, is it kind of feminist or not, then we're essentially kind of looking, well, in the context of the 1930s, potentially we do get shown kind of progressive views of women um, within the 1960s, yes, but against a kind of modern conception, maybe it's kind of more limited in kind of scope. So by talking about these kind of different periods, how different points of time would have viewed it, well, it would be viewed more of a feminist kind of text, arguably when it first comes out and in terms of when it's set than we necessarily view it as now, where we see it as more kind of 
limited essentially. Now the test here um, it is kind of applied to film um, and I think again it's it hasn't been applied to kind of literature as well though it's kind of it's a bit more limited in that scope but essentially it looks at the number of female characters in a, a film how much time they kind of actually spend being shown whether they have conversations with characters other than a male figure and when there are kind of female conversations whether they're actually about anything other than talking women to women about a male figure um, and in many ways Brody kind of passes this test yes there are a lot of occasions where they're talking about other male figures um, but there are occasions where Brody's talking to her students and they're not talking about male figures but and there obviously there are lots of female figures it's female centered narrative but at the same time there is also the various love interests that come into it across the the text um, and as part of it now the last thing to kind of place it in context here is that idea of surplus women and based on the kind of time setting um brody kind of falls under this category so within the context of the novel Brody is kind of into late 30s early 40s um, at the kind of time period we see her and she's then of this generation where following on from the first world war where a lot of men died and a lot of very young men died um, there becomes a kind of gender imbalance and there are then more kind of uh, women than men um, because of that there is a surplus supply of women and these women there are not enough husbands to be shared out now on one level this means that women are placed in this position where they, they're allowed to be independent they've got to be independent but at the same time we could argue that Brody is simply a reject within this system that there's not necessarily the same level of empowerment that goes with her working and aspects of her independence and power than there otherwise would be because rather than it being necessarily a choice it becomes something that's been kind of forced upon her so i think again just to set it off to set this debate into motion um i've got a little bit here from um critic kind of lisa rosman that i found online uh, the Prime Minister Jean Brody is hardly a treatise of fail libera uh, female liberation. So they're saying that, you know, from their point of view, not a feminist text really. A Google search digs up almost no discussion of Brody as a feminist or anti feminist icon. Yeah, this is right. I mean, I, I had a look around, there's very little that will argue this point of view. But she does kind of take into account, so yet, as embodied by Smith, so she's kind of um, focusing on the film version um, as much as the um, novel version of it, but never mind. Um, she offers a fascinating glimpse into a particular strain of 20, 20th and 21st century womanhood. So there are progressive elements, there are looks into what it is to be a woman, but it's hardly a treatise on female liberation so it's hardly entirely empowering but it does show some interesting angles and it explores that kind of um, view as part of it so i think this sets us up you could use this to help set up a kind of a point around um, the way that feminism is depicted within the narrative now the other thing to mention here um, before we move in and start looking at the evidence just remember you'll be kind of comparing here so you're thinking alongside as we're looking at these how Brody as a figure maybe compares into Mrs Lintart how it focuses in and um, looks in a kind of character like Fiona as well um, and what kind of parallels or differences you can kind of draw out from this that could then be reflected as you discuss it and create a, a response okay so so we need to think about the kind of evidence that we're going to use so at this stage you need to open up the sheet I've given you um, and uh, there's kind of various bits that I've picked out um, just to reiterate 
you shouldn't just be using the things that I'm giving you in terms of evidence. This is to form a kind of groundwork. You should be able to range across the text yourself. There are other bits you could pick out. What I'm giving you here are not the only things you could use, okay? Um, but what they should allow you to do is kind of decide um, around whether it's a feminist text or not, or how you can kind of argue a middle ground. But also what you need to be doing is kind of applying your terminology, looking for the features that kind of create that um, in as part of it, okay? So what I need you to do, um, I need you to open up the sheet. Um, I need you to read through each of them. And if you need to, if you've got the page references, open it up in the text itself, just to remind yourself of the overall context in which these appear. And I need you to decide whether you think they show a kind of an empowering view around women or something kind of disempowering and restrictive, but also to try and apply your terminology to think well, what is it about Muriel Sparks writing that creates that kind of image? What is it that she's bringing in that does that for us? OK, so go through it, be picking out those things um, and be kind of, you know, drawing it out you can argue a middle ground as well so for some of these you might say that it's both essentially that it um it both kind of gives an aspect of empowerment but also shows that it's only in a limited form and the restrictions kind of remain i would have thought you're probably going to spend kind of 25 30 minutes working through picking out the bits that you would use and just considering how it could then work into um, a kind of uh, a question that goes with this, okay? So pause me there, have a work through, um, and we'll see what you kind of draw out in a minute. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to have a look. Um, the first ones we'll do a little bit more briefly because you've already looked at those kind of yesterday. Um, in relation to the kind of opening chapter, so we won't dwell on them as much. Um, but if you think about um, the opening sections of the novel, Brody is depicted as um, powerful, essentially. She's a figure of authority, a figure of power, um, and in which case, as a woman within the narrative, this is potentially, you know, something kind of progressive. So you get the kind of metaphors that work through it, the flash as a meaningful accompaniment to a quiet voice. Um, you can talk about the adjectives. She's a mighty woman. You get the, the kind of dark Roman profile. And as we said, that kind of analogy into Julius Caesar that comes in with it kind of empowers her as well. You do get the kind of potential for her defeat. You get the reference to the kind of potential assassination that comes in with it. Um, so there's something kind of ominous within it, but there is something empowering about this characterization of her. And as you look at the second one, this kind of empowerment doesn't necessarily come at the expense of her sexuality. This is something that within kind of feminist um, kind of debate sometimes comes up that very often the um, a woman to have power and authority must compromise her femininity and this is kind of a bad thing and you can kind of debate around this but it does at various points within the narrative focus in on her kind of femininity um, so you get the kind of uh, it's the bit we were talking about with Sandy yesterday uh, her chest was breast shaped and large very noticeable um, and you also get within this bit, um, staring out the window, like Joan of Arc. And Joan of Arc, um, again, this kind of allusion to another kind of figure, um, the simile that's used within it. You can argue that this is an empowering one in many ways. Joan of Arc is the kind of female figure who leads the French against the English um, following on from the death of Henry V, if my history is in the right kind of order here. Um, and it kind of explores the way in which that kind of functions. Um, 
again, you could argue that there is a a more dubious aspect to this Joan of Arc. If you do a bit of research around her, you get kind of before she's allowed to kind of go into anything, she's kind of tested around her virginity and her purity and things like this. And there's a lot of kind of um, hate that surrounds her as well, even from her own French side, not just from the English side. And I believe she's she ends up burnt as at the stake essentially in the end. So again, not not entirely necessarily empowering, but you could talk around the link to Joan of Arc as well. Okay. Okay. Then we get the next one where Sandy is discussing with Jenny the kind of at a very young age, their understanding of kind of Miss Brodie's perspective and their kind of parents' perspective. And you get within this the separation of Brodie from their parents, from this kind of typical idea around kind of male-female relationships. So you get this kind of the concept of prime and it's linked in with kind of sexuality. Um, yes, but she never got married like our mothers and fathers. Um, they don't have primes. They have sexual intercourse. So there's this kind of differentiation created between Brody and their parents in terms of kind of sex. It, the language choices here for the parents make it more kind of scientific and functional. Um, they have sexual intercourse, whereas for Brody, it's something more kind of empowering, but it's still linked in. It's her prime. There's a an element of kind of liberation within this, we could argue. Um, so, again, you, you could discuss this around in various different ways. Um, as we go on to kind of the next one. You can argue that maybe in certain ways, it starts to shift and we start to see Brody actually kind of enforcing um, female stereotypes rather than kind of placed in a position of challenging them. So you girls must learn to cultivate an expression of composure is one of the best assets of women, uh, a woman, an expression of composure, come foul, come fair, uh, regard the Mona Lisa over yonder. So you get this reference into the Mona Lisa you get the idea of this as being the kind of idealized female form. Um, the idea that women have to kind of remain in a certain state at all times. The idea of this being kind of their best asset of a woman. So you talk about the kind of superlative use um, that she's actually kind of reinforcing the expectations. You must learn to cultivate an expression of composure. So you get that kind of modal verb. This is something essential to them, something that they have to do in order to kind of succeed in life, essentially. Um, then we start to get in the next one, um, the kind of the love affairs being introduced and Brody's kind of two interests um, become louder and um, Teddy Lloyd. Um, now, this is interesting as well. It's, it becomes a kind of debatable point. You can look at it both ways. In, the, in these relationships, arguably Brody is given more power than the male participant. But at the same time, she almost becomes unattractive through this. The power that she has makes her seem cruel so it's both something empowering but also um, something kind of disruptive as well so within this one we get um, he twitched her ringlets the more daringly since Miss Brodie always stayed with her pupils during the singing lesson so Lloyd here is um, depicted as no this is loud the reason sorry depicted trying to impress Brody um, and you get um, he looked at Miss Brody like a child showing off its tricks so there's a kind of disempowerment of um, Lowther through this the simile creates him as the kind of child desperate for the attention of the kind of more adult figure of Brody 
um, as if testing to see if she were willing to conspire in his un-Edinburgh conduct. So whether she is willing to kind of defy the more traditional kind of ideals that go with kind of Edinburgh at the time, it's more of a kind of traditional setting. Um, okay, then we get into the next one. Um, and again, you can kind of debate the point in this one. There is a sense that Brody, through the language choices presented as having a choice here, that she is um, the one choosing this path, but we can link it back into the idea of kind of surplus women and whether this is simply a kind of an illusion, essentially. So she says, you girls are my vocation, that simple declarative sentence creating something assertive. And you then get this kind of conditional um, element. If I were to receive a proposal of marriage tomorrow from the Lord Lion, King of Arms, I would decline it. So she's presenting, I'm choosing to dedicate my prime to these girls. Um, and that if she were to receive a proposal, she would refuse it. You know, so there's a choice presented here through the conditional. However, as we remember it in the context, Brody is in her late thirties into her forties. She is um, past the typical marriage age for the time period. So the reality of how much of a choice this is um, actually kind of remains dubious. And she then kind of instructs them further, form a single line, a uh, single file now, please, and walk with your heads up like Sybil Thorndike, a woman of noble mien, um, whereby she's kind of instructing them in um, to, to kind of act again in this kind of, with a focus on their bearing, on appearance. Um, Sybil Thorndike is a kind of Shakespearean and film actor, actress um, uh, of the time period. Okay, now the next bit is useful because it allows you to talk about kind of structure um, and it allows you to talk about the kind of changing chronology of the text. Um, we get these various kind of flash forwards, those proleptic uh, leaps forward into the future of the different girls. Um, and we get here, um, I think it's Eunice, um, oh, it's a long story. She was just a spinster. I must take flowers to a grave. I wonder if I could find her. Now, if you were debating and saying that Brody is made into a kind of powerful figure, a figure of interest, um, she's also kind of depicted as maybe not as powerful as she initially appears. Um, here she's dismissed as just a spinster. Um, and I wonder if I could even find it, that kind of questioning, suggesting that whilst she still remembers Brody, um, the actual impact upon her as an individual has not been as extensive. It's worth placing this into context in terms of the next one. So for some of the characters, as we get these kind of proleptic leaps, she's presented as more influential than others um, and more powerful than others. Um, so for Eunice, um, it's diminished, but then we get Sandy and I've contracted this bit, I've left out a bit, that's why there's the ellipsis in there. Oh no, said Sandy, but there was Miss Jean Brodie in her prime when she's kind of questioned about her major influences. And there's that reference into the prime that this is um, kind of changed Sandy, that Miss Brodie is her biggest influence and within the wider context of that kind of discourse, um, other influences talked about have been sort of Auden and uh, famous poet, poet figures and things like this. Um, but having said that, even this is mitigated slightly, you get the reference to the kind of transfiguration of the commonplace, which is supposedly Sandy's book. Um, and it's simply the, then the kind of transformation of those things that are common. Okay. Okay. And Essentially, Muriel Spark in this kind of longer section, I'm just going to pick out some various bits from her. I'm not going to do every word in this bit. Um, she points out that Brody is not necessarily as kind of individual as she might seem. 
Um, it is not to be supposed that Miss Brody was unique at this point. So there are lots of women going around like Brody, but at the same time, this is kind of diminished, who crowded their war-breathed spinsterhood with voyages of discovery into new ideas and energetic practices in art or social welfare, education or religion. And it starts to develop on this idea and you get this kind of long listing effect of the different things that they kind of come into. But at the same time, the kind of metaphor is important here, they crowded their war-breathed spinsterhood. So there's a kind of reasoning placed with this that places at the centre of this kind of discussion that the only reason these women are taking on these roles, these kind of things that we would maybe consider as empowering them is as a direct result of their emptiness elsewhere, that they are bereaved by the war. Um, so again, it's that we do get a progressive element, but this is linked to um, their kind of suffering elsewhere, essentially. Um, and as it kind of um, continues, let's pick out another quick bit from this bit. Hang on. Yeah, um, if you kind of look uh, further through, they could be seen leaning over uh, the democratic counters of Edinburgh grocers uh, shops, arguing with the manager at three in the afternoon on every subject from the authenticity of the scriptures to the question what the word guaranteed on the jam jar really meant. Now, Again, there's something kind of interesting about the way the Mural Spark kind of presents this in the there's something kind of empowering within the image that these are women of education. They are engaging in these contemporary debates, but there's also a kind of feeling of um, both us is probably the wrong word here, but there's something kind of mocking and satirical about this as well in that it's taking place in grocers shops. Um, they're arguing and it's kind of it. Yeah, both us does work here, I think, actually. They're arguing about the scriptures. This kind of really high kind of debate and then down to the idea of what guarantee means in jam jar. So it's kind of moved from the sublime to the ridiculous. And there's then a kind of futility in all this learning that they've got. There's something still restrictive about it. Um, so for all of this kind of development, for all of this desire to do something, it's still presented as linked back into the disruption, to the kind of status quo. And there, Mira Spark does create something kind of dubious and futile about it. And as you get to the end, but none, but those of Miss Brodie's kind were great talkers and feminists, and like most feminists, talked to men as man to man. So they, again, there is a kind of change of development. They are feminists. So from Euro Sparks' perspective, she defines Brodie as a feminist, and they talked to men as man to man. So there is this kind of growing equality, but she has also placed it against the inequalities that are still present and the futility of it at the same time. So it mitigates any idea of genuine progress potentially. Okay, now the other bits on that second page. Um, again, we get kind of various images that empower Brody. So Miss Brody stood in front of, um, stood in her brown dress like a gladiator with raised arm and eyes flashing like a sword. Hail Caesar, she cried again, turning radiantly into the window light as if Caesar sat there. Now, it's an interesting image. It, it gives Brody a kind of a masculine type angle. She's depicted as a kind of a powerful male role here, like a gladiator, so through that simile. But there is also that kind of implication here, the hail Caesar, as if Caesar was there. The fact that she is in a subordinate position and gladiators, not all the time, but oftentimes they, they are slaves. So again, you can argue that that image potentially kind of clouds the waters too. Uh, the next bit, Again, it comes back to the kind of idea of the love affair. And again, the way it's done opens up the debate and it allows you to kind of look at both sides. 
So you get the reference into Gordon Lowther and Teddy Lloyd. And they're both of them already a little in love with Miss Brodie. Um, and they're competing for her. So we get, um, where's it gone? Hang on, let me just find the better one. Yeah, sorry. You get the reference them uh, begin to act for rivals for her attention. So on one level, this kind of creates a Brody that again has a power and a kind of domination over male figures. But you could argue that it places her in the position of an object. She and it even describes this directly. She uh, for they found her the only sex bestowed object in their daily environment. So they're competing for her as a sexual object becomes the implication in the way that Spark has kind of depicted this. Um, so whilst she has a control, there is also the sense of her being competed for um, as part of it. She's a remains simply a figure of desire. OK, um, we then kind of move through and again, we get this similar kind of image coming into it um, where we're on uh, Gordon Lowther again and Sandy caught his glance towards Miss Brodie as if seeking approval. So again, there's that kind of Lowther in this kind of pathetic position. He's almost like a little puppy dog chasing after Brodie and Brodie is kind of empowered through the, the following image. Uh, as would a goddess with superior understanding and smile to a god away on the mountain tops. So, yes, Brody is elevated to goddess status. Yes, there's a kind of pathetic nature to Lowther within this. You do still get the reference into a kind of god on the mountain tops, potentially linking back into kind of Lowther, but. Um, you can also debate this going into Brodie's later treatment of Lowther, where she is cold to him, and this doesn't necessarily come across in a very kind of good light on Brodie. Um, yeah, let's have a look at the next one. So um, as we kind of go through, Brodie here does seemingly kind of also compete for male attention as well. Um, so following on from this kind of um, it's the kiss with kind of Teddy Lloyd and things like this. Um, there was indeed a change in Miss Brodie. It was not merely that Sandy and Jenny recasting her in their minds now began to imagine her as someone called Jean. So they try and see her as a kind of human individual. There was a change in herself. She wore newer clothes and with them a glowing amber necklace. So Brodie is still depicted through the clothing. As kind of seeking male attention and male desire for different reasons. Um, it had uh, so the reference to this amber necklace with its magnetic properties is potentially kind of symbolic of the attraction that she's seeking um, from those around her as well. Um, and again, the proleptic leaps forward becomes important within the next bit. Um, so there is, or start again, um, she creates a deliberate kind of futility around this Muriel Spark. And we do see um, Brodie later on, we get the reference to the fact that she's kind of died of cancer, essentially is the implication. And we see her here, Miss Brodie sat shriveled and betrayed in her long preserved uh, dark musquash coat. She had retired before time. She said, I'm past my prime. So while Sandy comforts her kind of in this exchange, there is a sense that she is, you know, she's failed essentially to genuinely capture anything. She's a defeated woman, betrayed, She's shriveled, she's not, I'm past my prime, and Spark shows her with nothing to show for it. Um, so it, it becomes a kind of anticlimax that you can talk about in terms of her depiction. Okay, and 
we then get into the references to the affair she's having with kind of Teddy Lee, uh, Gordon Lowther even. Now, again, this will like kind of debate around in various different ways. Now, within the context of the 1930s, her entering into this kind of extramarital affair without marriage, it's, it is kind of an aspect of sexual liberation The in terms of the time period would have been um, kind of more progressive. Um, and you get this kind of, it's implied here that this marks her out as different and kind of um, subversive. So it's Mrs. Gaunt who introduces this and it's to the two sewing teachers, um, all members of the kind of Catholic church, this more kind of restricted and traditional element. So it's important that Spark has them introduce it and in this kind of euphemistic way. So you get the reference to um, uh, she stuck a needle in and out of her embroidery and there's a deliberate kind of phallic image that goes with this. Um, it may be that Miss Brodie has the same complaint as Mr Lowther and the implication is that they are away, they're carrying out the opening stages of this kind of affair under the guise of being ill. You then get the kind of reference into the bit further on and again it fits in with this idea of Brodie in a sense being cruel there's also the element of th that she's still restricted in certain ways by um kind of society so for all that this is empowering it's not entirely empowering i renounced teddy lloyd but i entered into an affair it was my only cure so there's a choice here there's a desire on her part she's chosen a kind of sexual affair and you get the idea of it being a kind of cure in the metaphor there but at the same time that's almost hurtful to Gordon Lowther he's being used as an object here um, my love for Teddy was an obsession he was the love of my prime but in the autumn of 1931 I entered into an affair with Gordon Lowther he was a bachelor it was more becoming so that kind of comparative at the end there, it was more becoming that this is socially acceptable. She can get away with an affair with Gordon Lowther where she can't get away with an affair with Teddy Lloyd. Um, so there is that restriction that kind of comes into it still as well. Um, and again, we're just kind of coming with these last ones, to kind of reiterate some of the points we've made earlier in many ways. Uh, many a time she gave uh, the girls to understand that solutions to such problems would be quite useless uh, to Sybil Thorndike, Anna Pavlova and the late uh, Helen of Troy. Now, this again is an interesting one. She's talking about a number of the other subjects at school and Sybil Thorndike, the actress, um, the, then Anna is the um, kind of dancer. And then obviously you get the classical allusion to kind of Helen of Troy. They're all people about appearance, essentially. Helen of Troy, the kind of most beautiful woman ever to have existed. These other figures of kind of grace and appearance. And again, she's kind of directing the girls towards this aspiration in terms of womanhood. So how kind of progressive she is becomes a debatable point um, if she's simply focused on the girl's appearance as much as anything else. Um, as we go on to the other ones, she spent Sunday evenings with him also and more often than not the night in a sort of uh, def definite duty if not exactly martyrdom since her heart was with the renounced teacher of art. Now again interesting one in the you get the sexual freedoms that are implied through it through the kind of euphemistic more often than not the night but at the same time it's there's the cruelty in that it's one-sided there's a spirit of definite duty here in um Brody and it's kind of depicted further on the next one as well she looked uh, he looked at her with love and she looked at him uh, severely and possessively where you get the parallelism within the sentence 
the fact that it makes it one-sided um, and yes she's given a control here and an authority but there is a cruelty to it as well and you can't help but pity Gordon Lowther um, and ultimately she's kind of defeated in this again her power is taken away in the last one I've kind of picked out here um, uh, did a, if I wished I could marry him tomorrow so Brody's utterance here is depicted as sort of assuming a power um, it's sort of prideful and then instantly uh, Spark creates this kind of anticlimax the morning after this saying the engagement of Gordon Lowther and Mrs Lockhart the science teacher was announced in the Scotsman um, and Brody is kind of shocked by this her power has been taken away so just to kind of link into the other questions here because um, I think that's going to be kind of important um, as part of it as well um, when you are looking at this if you're thinking about the dangers of education you could link a number of the points here into the way in which Miss Brody is arguably still reinforcing ideas of gender stereotypes in her teaching to the students um, that you know that is a dangerous thing to do in that it, it simply maintains the status quo from a modern perspective we look for it to be broken because of the inequality that's present there um, you can talk um, within this um, about you know other dangers within education that you know the students become involved within the love affairs between the teachers as well and that can lead you into the the kind of abuse question too but we're going to kind of build on that in slightly more detail um, as we look at the kind of repressed sexuality of Brody um, and how that's dealt with next week okay so for the moment that is it people